I mean, recruiters are, are good. It's peer pressure, right? Like all your friends mm. are doing it. <laughs> um, oh, okay. It was yeah. just one of those things. Now, was that, that more common in, in Reading? Or? I think so. I mean, it's kind of a small town. So I think that, um, you know, everyone's looking for a way to get out and go see the world, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the, the sales pitch. I think my older sisters, I have two sisters, that they... Um, they both did really good in school. So they went straight to college mm-hmm. after high school. And I guess I just didn't really think about it at the time. Like in high school, I, I knew that that was a thing that people do, but I wasn't like doing the right stuff to probably prepare myself to leave right out of high school and go okay. to college. Okay. So when that became a viable option to join the Navy and then, then I could go to college. It just seemed like kind of, it made sense. 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 Same business, different day. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Same Business, Different Day podcast. Welcome to uh, sunny Southern California when we've got this heat wave, right? It's, it's hot. It's, it's so springtime and we're it. sweating. Yes. Uh, <laughs> first, I want to introduce myself. I am Zeke Corley and I want to introduce my partner in pod, my vote for the co-host of the year, oh. Alyssa Lee Good. How you doing? I'm doing great. Zeke, I wanted to say thank you for letting me be a part of this oh that's awesome i'm so yeah it's been a big part of my life it's pretty cool that's beautiful i love (laughs) it i love it and um i really appreciate it and you're more than welcome heck you're you're carrying me so here we go uh i also want to uh you know speak a little bit about the goal of the show right so the goal of a show of our show same business different day podcast is to tell the entire story of our guests in a way that they may not have the time to tell their own clients or employees the more you know about who you're working with and for the better chance you'll have of meeting in stride towards parallel goals think about that and this podcast is all about getting on the same page and that's why we're glad to have our guest today the same business, different day podcast is glad to welcome a Navy veteran, entrepreneur, author, family man, and genuine gentleman. Dave Baldwin, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alyssa, please tell us the rules of the game. Of course. Uh, so this podcast, we're here to talk about you, Dave, and about your professional life. But first, we want to get to know you personally um you know where you came from how you grew up so at a certain point we'll reveal what you do professionally but before then let's just have a nice conversation about who you are all right (laughs) tell us now you grew up in san you grew up here right for the first part of my life yeah um until i was about maybe nine or ten i want to say here san diego county like it's it's just uh so you grew up until nine or ten in san diego county yeah uh your your parents what your family what it, what were they doing um so my dad was uh in construction mm-hmm. um and um yeah we just we grew up like out lakeside el cajon east county area mm-hmm. east county um, yeah. i'm from east county <laughs> yeah it's even and, hotter uh, there <laughs> yeah um i mean my parents divorced when i was when i was young and okay. um eventually my mom and, and my sisters and I, we all moved to Northern California. Mm-hmm. Where? Um, uh, just outside of Redding, California. So it's almost, uh, I mean, really in between like Sacramento and Oregon. Like yeah. kind of middle of that North state. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, for like junior high and high school, I, I grew up up there. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. All over California. Okay. okay. So in high school, you went to high school out there as well then? Yeah. Okay. And then did you do any work? Did you have any mentors? Did you have any jobs out there? Uh, I mean, I I started working kind of, you know, in high school. Um, I think probably 15 or something. I started working at a Carl's Jr. Uh, Then it was actually my, my, one of my sisters got me the job. She worked at Carl's Jr. and they needed like a weekend person to open and at like five in the morning. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. You, know, sure, you were just the, the one who was available. Then. Yeah. <laughs> but I learned a, a, an important lesson. Getting up at five in the morning is no bueno. Uh, oh, so I thought you were going to say it's priceless. Know. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> so then I, I fast forward, I joined the Navy where that's their whole mantra. Just get up early. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. 
Yeah, that was um, clearly that that lesson didn't didn't stick. Uh, but yeah, those were my first. That was my first job was just fast food, and then um, yeah, I worked at like Denny's and you know typical teenage minimum wage. That's job. all just, good yeah. stuff yeah. though. I, at any time, I don't know. I don't know. It's just me being around food and serving <laughs> hungry people <laughs> at an early age actually teaches you a lot mm-hmm. because you have these hungry people, these angry people. You see these videos all the time where people are like trying to beat up the the uh, drive through worker or something, right? Because they are just, you know, a certain level of finicky, right? Because they're hungry or drunk. Yeah. But but the, the key is customer service, yeah. right? Trying to figure that out and navigate that situation. What, what was your... Did you ever work fast food? I never worked fast you food. You never worked in the restaurant industry at all? No. I mean, at the winery, I I do service. You know, yeah, I might yeah. serve someone. But, but you do understand. And, and in the winery, I, I know right. you. Under, well, certainly There's the, the drunk, drunk part. people, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I never worked uh, any restaurant. Wow. Wow. And I, I loved it. I loved the restaurant industry myself. The customer service that's involved with that. Um And, you know, once you satisfy them, well, you know, there's tips involved, too. You know, I I learned to work for tips at at an early, early age. Yeah, Yeah, I was always uh, either fast food or like when I worked at Denny's, I was in the back doing dishes. So I never got the tips. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, whatever. That's where I learned Spanish. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Did you have to deal with the high school kids at Denny's? I know that's kind of what they're known for, all the large groups of Um, younger kids. I don't know. I mean... Maybe here and there. I guess I don't really remember mm-hmm. too much of like sure. you know, anything like that. Um, but it was more or less just having a job, having that schedule. So you go to school, you're done with school, you you know, you got to go to work. Yeah. You know, all your friends are out having fun and you're like, oh, <laughs> I got to go wash dishes. Um, but then you have money, which you know, exactly. when you want to go out with your friends again, you're like, oh, you know, I can afford it. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> So what got into um, or, or how did you make that decision uh, to go into the military? I mean, there was a, at some point. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, recruiters are, are good. It's pure pressure, right? Like all your friends mm. are doing it. Um, oh, okay. it was yeah. just one of those things. Now, was that, that more common in, in Reading or? I think so. I mean, it's kind of a small town. So I think that, um, you know, everyone's looking for a way to get out and go see the world. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the. The sales pitch. I think my older sisters. I have two sisters. That they um, they both did really good in school, so they went straight to college mm-hmm. after high school. And I guess I just didn't really think about it at the time. Like in high school, I I knew that that was a thing that people do, but I wasn't like doing the right stuff to probably prepare myself to leave right out of high school and go okay. to college. Okay. So when that became a viable option to join the Navy, and then then I could go to college. It just seemed like kind of it made sense. What was that experience like? Uh, You know, the first two years were not that great. I think, you know, being kind of the low man on the totem pole and. And not to age you, but can you give us an idea of like time, years? uh, So this was 97. I graduated high school in 97. Okay. I I joined, you know. So you're like, you're only a few years older than me. Oh, okay. I'm just making that up. (laughs) (laughs) I graduated in 91. Oh, uh, (laughs) yeah. Your child prodigy, I guess. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I uh, yeah, first couple of years, you know, you're just going through school and learning. I was an electronics technician, so it was kind of the first couple of years were all just learning how to fix radios. That's a lot, though, right? I mean, did you have, was there any of that experience in your early life before you got there, or how did you choose the electronics technician? Um, you know, I, I, Going to high school in the mid late nineties, like there was this thing called the internet that was coming out. And okay. Like everybody was like, Yeah, this is gonna be huge. Yeah. We yeah, don't really yeah. know how big, but it's mm-hmm. gonna be huge. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you just think, I gotta do something with technology. I gotta do something with computers. I you know, mm-hmm. and, and so that was kind of my desire. And so again, the recruiter is, you know, they're slick, right? Like yeah, join the Navy. No, you gotta learn, tell me. I gotta hear these the, sales pitches. The, I gotta start using some of these. You, 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 and, then, you, and then you're fixing a radio that was made in like 1945. You know? mm, like, mm. You're like taking out vacuum tubes and like replacing oh, like gosh. old school technology. Uh-huh. But, yeah. What, I got into the, it thinking it was going to be all state of the art okay. technology. Mm. Okay. Now, were the recruiters your peers? Were the, were the people that you uh, like in like sort of in your age group? Like how did they identify with you so well? 
No, I, I just, it's other kids, you know? So, like, um, a buddy of mine who had already kind of signed on the dotted line and joined. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, He's like, come with me. He, well, he needed a ride to the, <laughs> to the, the recruiting because they did these like monthly meetings to kind of keep the people I've on board. I've heard this story And so before. like, he was like, Hey man, can you give me a ride? Yeah. Of course I had a job, so I had gas money. I could drive him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and huh. next thing you know, I'm, oh. wow. I've heard this it. story before. And you know, what's really funny about it. You and I were just talking earlier about auditions, right? Mm -hmm. And even in that kind of a realm, sometimes two people go, one person is supposed to be there and one person was the driver and that other person gets the part, right? Yeah. And so you got the part. (laughs) I did. And it was a great part. It was the best way to kind of come into being an adult. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like I said, the first couple of years weren't that great, but looking back on it, I mean, that was... It was a great period of my life. Okay. Six years, you said you did? Eight years. Eight years. Yeah. The Film Hub is the future of co-working right in downtown Vista. Get energized to go to a safe work environment that is clean and sanitized. Create video content, live stream events, and all of your marketing material in our audio and video facility. Come and visit us at thefilmhubinc.com. The Same Business, Different Day podcast is brought to you by yourinsuranceplace.com. YourInsurancePlace.com is a conglomeration of two agencies, Network One Insurance and Bill Corley Insurance Agency. Their property and casualty agents and brokers specialize in commercial insurance of all types, general liability, workers' compensation, professional liability, auto, agribusiness, and much more. They also have great insurance carriers for your homes and autos. How do I know they are that good? because I'm one of the agents. We believe in ourselves and you will too. Contact us at yourinsuranceplace.com or call us direct at 866-384-0479. That's yourinsuranceplace.com. Introducing the Ramona Valley Gnome Trail Scavenger Hunt. The gnomes are coming and turning San Diego County wineries into an unplugged village. Look for gnomes hiding out and clues about the wineries posted on their tasting patios for the month of May. Everywhere you see a gnome is a good place to unplug and unwind. Spot all the gnomes, solve the clues, and enter a raffle for a chance to win a prize. Sign up for this free event and get your first clue at www.unplugcollaborative.org. What was the transition like? You So after your experience with the Navy, what happened? What would you go into? Um, so I, I went into financial services. So yeah. I, I, I thought about going to law school. Um, I had kind of studied and taken my LSATs and I was kind of preparing to go that route. I, it's cause I, you know, I had that GI bill money and I was like, what, you know, I got to go get some important label <laughs> next to my name so I can make yeah. a good living. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it was really, I just, I didn't know that I wanted to commit myself to that much school. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I, as I was getting out, I went to a job fair and, okay. you know, it was just hap stumbled across uh, a guy that was recruiting financial advisors. And, you know, again, this is another one of those recruiting stories where they tell you it's going to be like, Oh, you're going to, you know, research stocks all day and you're going to be, you know, picking investments and doing, and I'm in my mind, I'm thinking like, I'm going to be like an analyst and it's going to be great. And then, come to find out it's actually a sales job where you got to go out and, you know, find people and get them to, to come and, mm-hmm. and, and buy your investments. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was just, uh, it was one of those things that kind of happened across it at a, at a job fair and thought, oh, this would be an interesting career. It's kind of like legal esque, right? I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's an element to it that, that kind of had that professionalism, uh, you know, professional ring sure. to it, like you'd think of, of an, a lawyer, an attorney. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I went for it. I figured I was young enough at the time. I was 25 getting out of the Navy. If I, if I failed miserably, I could have just gone back in the Navy. <laughs> right. So, uh, why not, you know, cool. try my hand on it and yeah. 15, 16 years later, here I am. Mm. That's awesome, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's time for the reveal. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Dave Baldwin is the kind of person that we all need. At times, when you don't feel like you're in the best place financially, you ignore people like Dave. But Dave is there to help you get to where you need to be. 
We hear about the stock market, interest rates, along with a lot of things that go over our heads, and we think that we're not ready to have these conversations with people like Dave. After a long history of financial planning success, his move from the Fortune 500 world to his own financial planning business, Dave Baldwin Financial, has allowed him to focus on his client, not his quotas. I think that this conversation is important today because if we all put the right amount of attention into our financial future, we can all reach the goals that many of us strive for. Money is not just an image, it's your future. Right there? Let's welcome back Dave Baldwin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, you know, uh, you're not the first financial planner we had on. We had Mark Gallo, I remember, mm -hmm. and we had a great time with him. Um, he actually had left met life and, and went off and started his own thing. But what we spoke about more was was him personally in that conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and this isn't necessarily just an advertising type platform. What we're trying to do is inspire. We're trying to inform. Right. And so, you know, that's what he did. And, and that was a great episode. But at the same time, I think that you can, too. And one of the things, obviously, you know, the book that Alyssa is going to get into later, I think that that's a piece of, of you know, that information. But what I, I really, you know, want to dig into is, you know, why finance? Who needs it? Obviously, we all do. But why don't some people know that they need it before, mm -hmm. you know, that time comes? Yeah, I know. That's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, to almost segue back to you asked how I, I got into this. Um, I remember back in, you know, kind of early 2000s, mid 2000s, there was a, a commercial on TV and it was a, it was a commercial for Morgan Stanley, but it was, this guy gives this really impassioned speech about like, it's a graduation ceremony. And he's like, I remember when you were just a little child and now mm -hmm. you're, you know, getting ready to go to college. Oh, yeah, and, you yeah, know, I like, see and you know, he, Pretty, pretty good speech. And, mm -hmm. and so this girl who is, you know, obviously the graduate, um, her friend leans over and he's like, your dad's kind of a softy. And she's like, oh no, that's not our dad. That's our Morgan Stanley guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just remember like thinking that's, I want to do that. Yeah. Like I want to have an impact on someone's life. I want to be, um, I want to help them to achieve whatever it was that they, they wanted to achieve. And I, I want to, you know, care about somebody with that level mm -hmm. that, you know, I would be able to see them through this process. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think, so, you know, to kind of answer your question a little bit better, I, I think the reason people don't seek out that level of help is that, um, you know, it's a very private thing, our finances, right? Like we're not, always super proud of the decisions that we make, <laughs> you know, like you are where you are today because of all the things that have kind of led up to that point. Yeah. And, you know, so some people might feel like they should be further ahead at this stage in their life and they're sort of embarrassed or, you know, they don't, they don't want to sort of let all the skeletons out of the closet. Sure, sure. Um, and, you know, then on the other side of that, uh, I think that, um, you know, my, my industry is sort of known as a sales industry. So, you know, there's there's some folks that are really aggressive and they they just kind of go after that that target, okay. that client. And yeah. so people are a little bit like, hey, let's I don't really want to be sold something. It's a little standoff. So it's just sure. it's hard to um, to kind of get that that trust that somebody would want to ask you for help. If on one end they're wondering if you're just trying to sell them something and on mm -hmm. the other end, they're kind of private about their finances because they're not, you know, it's just not a topic that we, we generally talk about. I will say I do have. I have a financial advisor and I love him. I mean, he's a lifesaver. He's basically created my retirement plan. You know, I know that as I get older that I, I have a plan and it's because of this guy um, and I'm sticking with him. And I always tell my friends, like, get get a financial advisor. You don't need the money. You just need the plan. And then the per that's this person's job to help you with the money part. And it always surprises me how few of them reach out to somebody I'm like, why wouldn't you? I, you know, all I did was reach out and I've set up a plan so that I know my future is secure. Mm -hmm. And what's the hesitation? Why, why aren't my friends taking the advice and reaching out? Um, you know, the, the status quo bias, it's infinitely easier to do nothing than sure. to do something, right? So you, you've got your day, you've got your, whatever you're doing, you know, already happening and yeah. to actively do something different takes energy and effort. So whatever, whether somebody admits it or not, they have a financial plan. 
right? <laughs> like, I mean, if you just simply look at your bank statements and look at where your money went for the last month, like that's your budget. That's, you know, if you keep doing that over it's and over month after move, month, right. that is your plan. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's that, that sort of status quo bias or just kind of staying the same is just a matter of, you know, if you're looking at your bank account and it's not negative, then, hey, uh, doing <laughs> you all right. made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you don't know, you know, what you don't know, then you don't know to, to be afraid of that. Right. So okay. like if you don't know what it takes savings wise to be where you want to be in 30 years, if you don't even know where you want to be in 30 years, then again, like that whole equation is kind of doesn't really matter. Well, hell, there's so much more to it. Right. Because then you you also and none of us really do. Right. Know the future. Like so if you're not planning something like the pandemic happens and knocks a lot of people off of their seats. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, working with a financial planner, you probably have you know some kind of contingency or emergency something or just right. if something bad happens, you can go back and revisit your plan and say, oh, well, we got to change this or change that. But someone who's maybe going at it without a planner just sort of every day, where am I at? OK, mm -hmm. what do I need to do today? And mm -hmm. and so um, you know, they, they, yeah, I, I think one reason that people don't necessarily go to a planner is just because it's, it's a change from what they're normally doing. Mm -hmm. And if they don't want to think about the emergencies or they don't want to think about the bad things that could happen, you can just put that in the back of your mind and keep cruising through life. Right. Mm -hmm. Now what's that? Uh, I mean, you know, we're, and, and we're going to get into the book and we, we, we need to get into the book, but I, I really want to talk about like that transition like that move from uh, a, a large corporation into doing your own thing. Uh, what's that that step like, and and what uh, got you to make that decision? It's it's scary, right? I mean, you you work for a company whose you know their brand name was part of your identity, and and so you have to kind of ask yourself: Were my clients or were people that wanted to do business with me doing business with me? Or was it this brand name that they had that they found value in? And and so that is a bit of a leap of faith. And that kind of goes back a little bit into I'm sorry, I'll let you finish. But um, you seem to have an aversion to sales pitches <laughs> like you're not a sales guy is, is what it sounds like. Right. So if they were doing all the sales pitches for you and now you're having to step in and say, I have my own thing and I'm, I'm doing it on my own and, and I'm kind of getting away from that. That's got to be a little scary, right? Yeah. And I don't know that they had a sales pitch for me. Okay. Uh, they had a quota that, you know, like I sure. had to go out and make a certain amount of sales to maintain sort of their standard. Okay. Um, but, you know, it wasn't that they were doing any of that work for me. I, I guess I would say just if you meet someone first time, and you have to build some kind of trust or rapport. You have if you name. have a brand name that yeah. they're familiar with, that might be easier than, hey, I'm just a stranger. And, <laughs> you know, I might be, seem nice and, and have good conversation, but, um, you know, it's just that it, that's a tough hurdle to, to kind of overcome, I, I think. So that's part of the fear of making that move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I... I I felt that I could provide a, a better level of service and mm -hmm. I could do it for, you know, a, a more reasonable cost. Um, you know, when you're employed by a large firm, they have a lot of overhead that goes beyond just simply servicing that client. Right. I mean, they've got a big company to support. Mm -hmm. There's a, sometimes there's a national marketing campaign. I mean, commercials on TV are not cheap. Mm -hmm. um, they have an element of, training new people. So that's, that's a big cost to the business. And that cost is supported by the revenue that they generate. So if they're, you know, a, a big fortune 500 company and that, again, that is coming from, that's a measurement of revenue. So the, the top 500 companies by revenue are that fortune 500, um, you know, that, that's a lot of money they need to raise. To pay you're for responsible. These operations. Exactly. For, yeah. Exactly. So by not having to, um, you know, sort of keep up with that element of the expenses, mm -hmm. then I can do this job for my clients again, for a more reasonable, more reasonable fee. Mm -hmm. Should we do the book corning? Let's do the book corning. Yeah. I think that's a great I'm idea. excited about this book corning. <laughs> episode. 
because Dave has written his own book. Yes, <laughs> yes. Dave Baldwin, the author of The Balancing Act. Um, so I haven't read the book. Uh, full disclosure, because you just gave it to me, <laughs> um, but I will read it. It's it's good. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's my understanding that so you, the balancing act you're talking about balancing financial finances as far as what you have and what you need. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I don't I don't think anyone needs to be a minimalist. I mean, it's kind of up to you, and I I definitely don't mean to make anyone feel bad about what they're spending their money on. We're all free to to do whatever we want. But one thing that that sort of stood out, and this over my career, I've met people who make, you know, all kind a, a spectrum of incomes, right? I've met sure. people that make two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, and they're still living paycheck to paycheck. And I've met people that that make fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and they're fine. They've got plenty of, <laughs> you know, leftover money. Sure. And you know, it's so everybody's different. Everybody's free to kind of do whatever they want. But there's a, a lot kind of happening psychologically underneath the surface that sort of guides some of our decisions. No doubt. And, you know, one of those things is this idea of adaptation. So, you know, even if you if you feel like I don't have enough money and the only solution is to go make more, oftentimes that will result, now that you have more money, you're going to find more things to spend that money on. So mm -hmm. even after putting in all that extra effort to make more, afterwards you're not really any better better off because you you've adapted to that new higher income and you mm. you've spent that money mm -hmm. um so kind of that balance between what you need and what you have is is instead of falling into that trap or that that just that constant wheel of you know making more spending more mm -hmm. taking a more introspective look at what do i really need okay. what what makes me happy what you know what's important to me and then designing the lifestyle that lines up with that so you're not necessarily having to chase after money but you're just finding ways to live comfortably within your means okay i'm going to take a step and say that um you know as you've outlined a, a number of different reasons why some people you know have trepidation right uh to meet up with someone you know a, a good financial planner um, I would take a step and say that a lot of them may believe that you all think the same, that you all look at them the same. So, right, if we're talking about the person who makes 50, 60 grand, we're talking about the person who makes 300, 400 grand, whatever it is that you look at them and you say, I already came in here with my idea of what save, how to properly approach your finances. I'm not going to look at you individually and see what you like, what you don't like, and actually custom make this thing. Can you can you debunk that a little bit? Uh, that do you do you come in there with your own mindset, or do you come in there and actually figure out what it is uh, that they like and dislike, and where the cutbacks could be? So I, I think individuals have to make a decision for themselves okay. on what they want, don't want. And and no one's going to respond well to, you know, a, a professional coming in and saying, oh, well, you can't, you can't have that. That's irresponsible to spend your money on that. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's not my job. My job is not to tell people what they should or should not spend their money on, but more to show them how to achieve the goals that they want to achieve. And then it's really a matter of you know, the person deciding what's more important to them, right? Like, where do your priorities lie? So one of the things I talk about in my book is this idea of prioritizing and compromising. So if you have your goals and you have kind of what you're spending your money on, now you can start to weigh which one's more important to me, right? Is this expense more important or is this goal more important? If I can show you how to get to where you want to be, then, it, then you're empowered to to start making some of those decisions. If you don't know what this goal costs, you would never know that this thing I'm doing is in direct opposition to the goal that I want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's not my job to tell someone what they should or shouldn't do, or it's really just trying to empower them to be able to do what they want and get what they want, you know, understanding what it would take to get that. And then there's a lot of, you know, just things that the normal person probably isn't aware of. I mean, there's a lot of tax uh, 
issues when you try to save money a certain way or if you don't save money a certain way. There's just inefficiencies in that process that I can help maximize for the, for someone, you know, how to most efficiently get to where they want to be. Hmm. Who's our target? Like, are, are we talking about people who are making making money, making a certain amount of money? Are we talking about a certain age group? I know that's kind of what we've been discussing, but I, I kind of really want to just kind of nail this down because I think that if we get into uh, the details of this, I, I think it's more informative to our to our audience. Um, who who really uh, I shouldn't say who could benefit from you the most because, you know, anyone could. Right. But who do we really want to look at to say, hey, if you were to, you know, have these conversations with me, uh, this would change your life. And I, I think that it's it's really someone who wants the help, who wants. To, and that's the hard part. right? It, it is. But I think that my industry, unfortunately, my industry and it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, kind of the sales the or the quota is everybody wants to go after people with lots of money. Right. Mm-hmm. If if you have a, a quota where you have to bring in half a million dollars of new assets to the firm every single month, are you going to go after one person with half a million dollars or 50 people with ten thousand like, dollars? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Probably not going to gravitate towards people that don't have a lot. And I think, you know, unfortunately, in my industry, we just put so much emphasis on sort of people that, that already have a lot of money. Um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to sort of make my knowledge, make my resources available to people, no matter what level they're at, that, you know, they can get to where they want to be. And, you know, the, the, the information necessary, the tools needed to do that Mm -hmm. should be available to everybody. And it shouldn't be something that, you know, my industry is only going after people who've already sort of solved the riddle and, and saved up half a million dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when I say that it's anybody who wants help, I, I literally mean anybody, anybody. Mm -hmm. That's so important though. Right. And, and, uh, you know, it's so hard to convince them, you know, do they really believe that? Because that's, that, that is important and it's key. It's, it's, um, it's true too, you know, and I know that from experience that, um, everybody could afford this type of help. Mm -hmm. everyone Mm -hmm. literally (laughs) um so i have a lot of friends that you know we're all sort of experiencing finances how to handle it mistakes are being made and some people i have a few friends who have a serious debt problem um and are figuring that out so what do you say to the younger people who immediately get into debt issues um, and are trying to climb their way out yeah, debt, debt's a big challenge. And, you know, when you think about the things that are happening behind the scenes in your mind that, that make us gravitate towards debt, right? I mean, we want something now, so we want immediate gratification. Mm-hmm. And we don't think about what the consequence is to, future, to our future selves. And so when we, when we utilize debt, we look at that as like, I have this available to me, even though it's not actually my money. I have this credit card, I have this. And so, you know, part of not using debt is really having the ability to sort of delay gratification and say, yes, I want this thing, but I, you know, the, the, the way to achieve that is not get it now, pay for it later. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, there's, you can pay for things sort of after the fact that you can buy it now, but then pay for it later. And then you're paying more than you paid for the actual item because you're right. paying the interest on the money borrowed. You can pay for things in advance because you can say, hey, I'm going to save up money. So if I want to buy something that's $1,000, you know, I can save up $1,000 and then pay for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in doing that, you you know that the item costs $1,000, but you might actually get it for less than that because whatever money you've saved might actually grow on its own right? Yeah. Closing that gap between what you need to afford the thing. But also if you're not buying the, the hot new brand new technology that's coming out or like maybe, you know, it's whatever it was that you were trying to buy was a thousand dollars today, but by delaying that and saving up over the course of a year, it might actually come down in in (laughs) cost. So it might not actually cost you more. It might cost you less. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And so, you know, I think that the mindset 
that someone has to sort of understand when it comes to debt is is really about delayed gratification mm -hmm. and you know then kind of and and I would encourage this is a plug for my book I hope you don't mind but I would encourage <laughs> anyone to read the book Please. because you know there's a lot there's so much going on psychologically yeah. behind the scenes that help us to justify a lot of these things that are really not good and mm -hmm. if you understand them and you understand the marketing effort that you're up against maybe you'll be able to overcome that temptation um you know I, visa let's i mean if the average household has you know 15 or 16 thousand dollars worth of credit card debt and visa is charging 20 percent on that debt Yikes. right i mean that's you know so you're paying thirty two hundred dollars a year in interest to maintain this credit card debt right mm -hmm versus someone in my shoes who's trying to encourage you to save money. So Visa is trying to encourage you to spend money. Mm -hmm. Like the, all the commercials are like, hey, you've got the card. Just go get what you want. That's right. And you know, I'm encouraging people to save money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm charging nowhere near that much, uh, you know, for for what I'm doing. And yet people still kind of look at my industry and like, I can't believe you charge money for that. That's You know, <laughs> whereas like Visa yeah. or MasterCard or any of these, you know, credit card companies um yeah i mean the, the amount that they're charging people to just keep encouraging them to spend 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 right? yeah yeah that there's, <laughs> there's there's no avoiding it it's just about figuring out how mentally how you can handle dealing with you know so you don't just it's kind of like uh the late night fast food commercials, right? And the melty cheese, and you just like, you know, want to get up off of the couch and go over there and buy that food. You have to, you have to turn that off yeah. in your head. And you don't have to plug your book because we will. Yeah. Uh, Dave Baldwin is the author of The Balancing Act: yeah. Creating Financial Freedom in the Balance Between What You Need and What You Have. I do have a question about credit. Um, I sort of hit the world of credit later on and it became really difficult for me to get any kind of loan without a co-signer. Um, and so how should someone prepare themselves for a good line of credit? You know, that's, that's a, that's an interesting topic. I, I think that, um, is my own experience. I remember when I was, uh, in the Navy and I wanted to get a loan, um, I was told no, cause I had no, no credit history. Right. So I, I literally walked into the bank. I had $500, right? Mm -hmm. I said, can I borrow $500 and just immediately pay you back? And they said, no, because you have no credit history. Yeah. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, um, you know, when, when part of the industry to lend us money is creating this idea that you have to have good credit history. Because that will allow you to be a participant in our economy. Yeah. Our, you know, you need to have good credit. Mm -hmm. And sure, you can establish that good credit through, you know, getting a bill and paying it on time. But really ask yourself, what do you need the credit for? Because right. uh, to buy a house, yes, mm -hmm. you need credit. But your credit score is really only telling the whoever's lending you the money, what's the likelihood <laughs> you not make a payment in the next 30 days? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like... Again, if you have the appropriate amount of income and you have, you know, you're buying something reasonable and you don't have examples that anyone can draw on that says they might not pay you, mm -hmm. you're, they're going to lend you money. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't put an emphasis on establishing credit um, because what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. I mean, certain things you might need, you might need to buy a car. The utility of having a car is necessary. Mm -hmm. You got to get to work. But even then, do you really need credit to buy a car. If you're going to go buy a forty thousand dollar car, yeah, probably. But what if you're just going to go buy a car you can afford? A car you you don't really need the credit. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's almost a myth that the you know that 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 the the, the, the industry kind of puts out there like you have to have your credit established because we want you to be a good consumer and we want you to yeah. borrow money whenever you want it mm -hmm. and so get that credit established. And I'm not saying that you don't have to have it because again, to buy a house, to buy a car that you need. Yeah, you do have to have some kind of track record, but it doesn't take a lot to establish credit. Okay. Um, you know, one or two lines of credit that you pay off are enough to give you a good credit score. And then there you go. Yeah. I remember because I bought um, a car recently and I struggled to get the loan for it because I didn't, I had great credit, 
but I didn't have much history. And so, and I think that's where my argument back to you would be, what was the emphasis of borrowing? Like, why not, you know, save up for a while and then, you know, have a bigger down payment or buy a less expensive car, even if it's not the one you wanted, right? It's not brand new, (laughs) it's used. Um, But you can still get the utility of being able to drive from point A to point B, right? I mean, that's what you need the car for, to get Mm -hmm. to work or to do whatever. But is it really necessary? Well, not everybody, Dave. Some people drive the car so they can be looked at. Well, and, and that, that's fair, right? <laughs> but, you know, again, I'm, I'm just saying if you if you look at it from the perspective that you don't necessarily need sure. to have established course, credit, you course. can still accomplish everything you wanted to with mm-hmm. okay. borrowing that, large something. That's true. Money. I could have bought a less expensive car, but I wanted this car. <laughs> yes. But you got the right car. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Dave, let's talk a little bit uh, more about business, right? Yeah. Um, in, you know, differentiating yourself uh, from the competition. I know that uh, when we get out there and, and we'll talk a little bit more about networking before we finish up, because that's how you and I met. Um, but when we talk about the fact that, you know, someone comes up to you and says, I'm a financial advisor, I'm a financial planner, I'm an insurance broker. Right. You know, uh, we're everywhere. Right. What separates you? How do you separate yourself? And I'm not asking you for a sales pitch because I know that's your thing. But what I'm what I am saying, though, is that uh, there has to be something uh, in a land this vast of that many of of one, you know, group uh, that separates you and, and, you know, allows you to continue the conversation with someone uh, and, and, you know, gain clientele because that's got to be part of the fear. Right. You go out on your own and it's like, well, how am I going to get clients now? Now I've left this large corporation and there are all of these other sharks out there in the ocean. How am I going to get business? Yeah. And I I think that, um, again, kind of leaving that environment where there was sort of a a quota Mm -hmm. or like, hey, you have to get new clients. You have to bring in new money Mm -hmm. Um, when you're when you're under that kind of pressure and you meet someone new, you're like. I really want this conversation to lead to, you know, us doing business. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that subconsciously it's, it's present, right? The other person can probably sense that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't have that anymore. So it's kind of like, I get to decide, do I want to work with you? Yeah, that, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like you're hiring you the kind and of firing a client. I would like to, to, you know, engage in. And, and it mm-hmm. goes back to what I said. It, it, I want to work with people who want the help. Cause I, feel you know uh, i i benefit from you know uh, emotionally like it 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 helps me if i know that i'm helping Helping someone someone. and so again having those conversations now from a different perspective of let's let's find out more about zeke and let's you know really see if we're if there's a friendship there if there's a um an opportunity and 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 so you know i can't say that that differentiates me from everybody right but i think that that kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, again, I, I, I do have some resources that, that I can share with people that again, after you know, so many years and, you know, writing a book and just things that I can share that are a perspective that might be different than everybody else. That's right. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it does just go back to kind of having a, a good conversation and if there's a connection, if there's an opportunity to, to serve somebody and to help them, then, you know, I, I obviously want to put my best foot forward and shoot for that, but mm-hmm. yeah, there's, there's not a lot of pressure. That's good. Yeah. That's good. You, you take away some of that pressure and, and yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you. Ed, and, and the answer is yes, we are friends. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say? Uh, I was just going to say that kind of leads to networking. I mean, mm-hmm. People trust in business is essential. Um, if people can't trust you, they're not going to do business with you. Um, and so just having that persona of um, I want to get to know you. Here's who I am being open about yourself, which I mean, I met you today and I, I can see that in you. Um, it's so important. And, and that's when it comes down to the networking aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, not everything is about getting a client. Sometimes it's just about making a connection um, within the community. Um, I know you're with your, the ch- local chamber. Mm-hmm. It's um, a board member, right? Yeah. 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 For the Vista chamber. Of Commerce. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, that's all a part of being a business owner is just having that persona of I'm here to work with you. I'm here to help you. Hi, I'm Jeff Fox, founder of Star Fox Media. 
We are a digital marketing and video production company that focuses on serving small businesses here in Vista, California. We have the team and all of the equipment necessary to produce, film, edit, and distribute your podcast to as many people as possible. For more information, you can reach out to us via email at info at starfox.media or give us a call at 760-385-3117. Let Star Fox Media help you tell your brand story today. The San Diego craft beer industry has proven to be incredibly resilient. Regardless of tier, they're following all guidelines to ensure the safety of their loyal customers and staff. They want you to feel safe coming out, enjoying a beer, or picking it up to go. Breweries are open and welcoming guests into a sense of normalcy through a great craft brew. While resilient, the beer industry isn't immune to the effects of service limitations and decreased foot traffic. They need your help to stay open and continue serving the craft beer they're famous for. If you're looking for ways to support your favorite local brewery, stop in for a beer, grab some merch, or take some home to share or enjoy later. Cheers. North County Daily Star is the leading source for news and community information along the 78 corridor. It's free to subscribe and it is updated daily. Look for us on your mobile device or computer at ncdailystar.com. The Vista Chamber of Commerce is a proud supporter of the Same Business, Different Day podcast. We support our business members with promotion and marketing, business referrals, educational opportunities, workforce development, and advocacy. Check us out online at vistachamber.org. Yeah, I think that um, from a networking standpoint, you know, people, when it comes to like referring business or Mm -hmm. like sending somebody to somebody else there was um i I don't know the guy that did it but it was it was a study about sort of why people refer Mm -hmm. and you know after asking you know all the why did you refer your friend or your you know someone to this person over here Mm -hmm. two-thirds of the people responded that they did it because they they knew someone that needed something and they wanted to help that person get what they needed so they referred them to the professional that they thought could best help them. Right. And one third of the referrals were because I've got this buddy of mine who's a professional and, you know, he or she does this job and I want to send business their way. And, and when you break that down and think about it at the end of the day, most of us are not interested in just sending business to someone for the sake of sending business to them. We're interested in, in helping someone who needs help. Sure. So, um, you know, not to give names, but I've, I've referred, uh, you know, people to you sure. that, you know, again, I recognized, Hey, someone I really care about has this problem and they need this solution. Yes. And so when we first met, it wasn't about, can I send Zeke some business? It was, right. I know somebody that really needs mm-hmm. help with this area. And, mm-hmm. and, and that was the, the basis of that referral. And so when you think about networking again, that's the stage that you want to be able to set is, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to befriend everybody in my network so that they will just send business my way because they want to hook me up with Mm -hmm. a new client. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to show them what I can do for people and the value that I can bring so that when you know someone who needs that service or needs that thing, then you know where to send them. Okay. That's right. Yeah. But there's also a key in developing that valuable relationship, right? They, because what you've done is you have established trust. And if if the person that you're referring the business to delivers, then you know that they could deliver any other time that that's needed as well. Yeah, that's yeah, I, I love it. You know, one other thing that I uh, wanted to mention earlier, um, and it kind of came up in, in an earlier episode. I think the episode was with uh, Chris Ryan. And we talked about uh, a little bit about moving for the sake of, you know, business, for family, for for, you know, trying to create something better for your life, for your future. Um, And it seems like you moved around a a little bit for for business uh, just to make sure because I think that's important. Right. I I think that a lot of people have such an ideal situation as, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and so forth, which is like. Oh, this is going to work out. I'm going to sit here in my penthouse 
and I'm going to come up with this idea or I'm going to be right here on the beach in Carlsbad or whatever. And I got this idea and it's going to pan out and everything and the money's going to flow this way and it'll never go back that way. But at the end of the day, sometimes you have to, uh, you know, make concessions and move around a little bit in order to eventually get to where you are. And and again, congratulations on where you are now. But it seems like you definitely had to uh, make some sacrifices and, and some moves in order to get here. Is that right? Yeah. Um, both, you know, professionally, just in, in where I work, but also, you know, physically. My, my wife and I, you know, when I got out of the Navy and I got into the, the industry of financial services, I was a financial advisor here in San Diego. And then I moved to Kansas City to work for, it was ultimately the same company that I was a financial advisor for, but I moved to work for their home office. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I met my wife, was in Kansas City. And then okay. you know, we moved um, to the San Francisco Bay Area um, and lived up there for a little while. Um, again, doing the same, working for the same company. Mm -hmm. um, and then moved back down here to San Diego. Um, when I had kind of affiliated with my former uh, employer and, and, you know, those moves both just professionally for a career plus, you know, physically moving locations. I mean, you, you kind of go into that thinking this is a big cost, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big undertaking to do this, but, but it's going to be worth it. Yeah. And that also kind of motivates you to really work hard to make it worth it. Cause I mean, the worst thing would be you make this big move and then you find yeah. out it's all for yeah. nothing. You're already right? upended. So yeah. why not go for um, it? Um, but so, you know, I think that that's that willingness to kind of make that, that sacrifice or make that transition, um, kind of shows you that somebody's they're they're, you know, they're in it. They're, they're committed to that. Yeah, that's right. They kind of put their cards on the table and they've, they've, um, They've made that big move. So I, I think that that, um, yeah, anybody who's willing to, to kind of take that big leap, you know, go for it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, you know, if if we're not going to talk anymore about, I, I don't think we need to talk anymore about the COVID effect because I think we all kind of understand, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, how that's, uh, you know, affected us all. And, um, but I, I think during this during the time during COVID is when you kind of made your decision, though, you you did make that step or, you know, take that leap during this time. And so, again, congratulations on taking that leap. And I know that, you know, the future has so much more for you. And I know that you're informing so many people uh, as you have been already. Uh, again, with the book, The Balancing Act, mm -hmm. everybody check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us another tip, just a, a tip on the way out? I want you to teach the youth something, give them a little financial tip or, or whatever, or, or even if you want to just talk about a, a business, entrepreneurship, just ideas on, uh, you know, starting your own thing, uh, going out on that limb, it, you know, whatever it is, you know, just throw something out there for the, for our audience. Well, you know, whether it's a savings uh, thing or it's, you know, an entrepreneurial kind of, it's it's setting a goal. Right. It's yeah. kind of identifying this is what I want and this is what I have to do to get what I want. And if, Beautiful. if you don't set that goal, then you're just sort of like aimlessly moving in some direction when you you know, write it down, get it on paper, put thought into it and, yeah. and make it something, whether it's a career aspiration, whether it's a dollar amount that you want to save, whether it's a purchase that you want to make, whatever it is you know, identify what that goal is, write it down. Yeah. And then, then you can start to take the steps towards getting there. And I would, I would say one other thing, you know, the sooner, the better, right? yes. I mean, because we only have a finite amount of time to, to get to where we want to be. Right. And mm -hmm. it takes time to achieve some of these goals. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. <laughs> the second best time is right now. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. And, and that's, so yeah, have Perfect. a goal and, and get going. I love it. <laughs> yes. I like it. That's Dave Baldwin, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation because it was amazing. Can we get some contact info, yes, please, Alyssa? Definitely. Um, so I recommend you check out Dave's website to learn more about his business. That's www.davebaldwinfinancial.com. <laughs> You can find him on Facebook at Dave Baldwin Financial. And Dave's provided his email. That's Dave at DaveBaldwinFinancial.com. 
And the last one I should have asked you before, but you already gave me a signed copy. How can someone find your book, The Balancing Act? Um, so Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. Um, I think uh, if you go to my website, there's a link to go to the book's website, which is okay. uh, thebalancingactbook.com. Uh, and there's a link there to, to take you to Barnes & Noble or Amazon to buy it. Um, and, you know, I would like to say, guests or friends of the show anybody that you want to give a book to um i'll, I'll give you a couple extra copies and you can, oh, wow. you can give them out to people oh how exciting thank you <laughs> beautiful beautiful thanks so much dave for for visiting with us today we really appreciate it man this was awesome thank it you. really was great information and uh you were a great guest i'm glad we finally did it yeah thanks for having me. all right thanks dave <laughs> same business different day Thank you for tuning in to the Same Business, Different Day podcast. Special thanks to Star Fox Media for video production and James Russell on music production. Please like and subscribe to the Same Business, Different Day podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Same Business, Different Day.